And we're back, everybody. My name is Samantha Lunzessi. My name is Roy George Phil, the one and only, the first, the first, the first, the first. <laughs> Maybe the last, too. Yeah, probably the last. Um, and this is Masculinity. Yo, so the other day, let me tell you something. So uh, I was in the city. I was on 23rd Street. I just got out of a really cool meeting at Radio Lab. And shout out to Radio Lab. And I was, I was feeling good. And I popped out of the subway, the AC at 23rd Street. And we're going to another meeting, and this other meeting's got really good potential. So I'm hyped, and uh, I'm just, I grab my phone, I pull out my phone, and there's an alert. And I read the alert, and without even any other uh, in, like prompt, I just start screaming and shouting and like oblivious to the world around me because the alert said, Dwayne Wade has been traded back to the Miami Heat. And I'm fucking excited and thrilled. Uh, and then one of my friends who's with me is like, yo, you just scared the shit out of that lady. And I looked over and the lady had dropped all her bags. Oh, my shopping, God. Grocery shopping <gasps> on the ground. It was like staring at me. And I was like, oh, my bad. <laughs> Obviously, she was not from Miami. Yeah. I'm happy for Gabrielle Union, too. She seems juiced about it. I have much more interesting news. I'm just oh. kidding. I know. That was shots fired for like no reason. No reason at all. Whoa. I know. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. Um. I'm obsessed with organized crime, apparently. Mafiosa. Yeah. And Netflix has these shows called, this show called The History of the Italian Mafia that like basically tracks the history of the Ita- like Italian mobsters I think, like, in New Samantha's York. Samantha's got all these weird obsessions I like serial killers, uh, organized crime. Anyway, this show is crazy. It like tracks like five Italian families or whatever and like how they like, owned like you know all kinds of businesses to, like cover their tracks i'm only on episode three but i'm pretty sure i'm gonna finish that shit this weekend the other thing that uh, was on my mind is have you heard of the concerned women for america no idea what you're talking about so it's this like conservative group of women that <sighs> it's supposedly like for gender equality well i don't know if they said that specifically but they said that they're against violence in the home specifically targeting children and you know the whole shit with ron porter popped off recently right it's okay so ron porter is in the administration right and like basically two of the two of his ex-wives have come forward with like pictures or whatever of like a black guy and like some other shit you know, like saying that he abused them. And there was also like a lot of mental abuse that happened in the midst. And I think that people are really hoping that, you know, while we talk about like physical abuse, we're always also going to be talking about mental abuse. But this group comes out and is like, and people were like, okay, so what's up? Are you guys going to call these fools out or what's going on? You know? And they're like, well, you know, we're really into their policies. We're really into the policies of the administration. So, I mean, while we understand that it's not great, like these, sex- these, you know, these assault allegations against both the president and a number of people in his administrations are really are not great. But, you know, we stand behind their policies. And so that's what we're going to focus on. What policies? What policies are they fucking standing behind? Right. Like, really? I mean, so that's what we're dealing with here. And I feel like. I just and, and you know as we get started with this conversation about about binaries and like partisanship and like looking at oppositional views I just think it's like so you're really going to tell me that you are against violence but you're going to stand behind somebody's policy because they're motherfucking republican that's all that's all it's just because they're on the right side for you and it's just it just goes to show how much like all of these binaries that we have in society are just not serving us. They're not serving us at all. Yo, uh, so my podcast conversations have, for the most part, stayed uh, pretty gendered. I mean, uh, whether it's conversations about sports, whether even it's been about men who have been victims of violent crime, whether it's been about Hollywood and, and the approach for men to be conditioned to take their women, all these things and so much more, I've made it about me and my experience as a cisgendered male, right? And a lot of my criticisms and ideas come from my experiences, and again, that's from a cisgendered experience. Uh, but what we, we know and what I'm coming to learn more and more each day is that this isn't a cisgendered world that's right it's not female it's not male it's not black and white 
and uh, preaching from a pulpit that only speaks to a limited range of experience is pretty exclusionary. So when uncovering the ways that masculinity is performed, I think we've mostly focused on cis men and as a standard group from which that performance is expected. And we've discovered actually that that expectation is dehumanizing, but gender is a spectrum and fluid. So we have to remember that it is a spectrum and it is fluid. Exactly. It's not binary in the least. So gender is a spectrum and it's fluid and we've been focusing on cisgender and mostly heterosexual guys if we're going to be real about it. So we're neglecting the other places and the other people where masculinity shows up as a performance or simply as an experience. And honestly, that's what's so exciting about this conversation, right? About masculinity expanding and questioning what we think we already know. And so masculinity being a construct that we must just thoughtfully engage with if we're committed to equality, no matter, you know, gender or sexual orientation. So, uh, full disclosure here, like, uh, I'm constantly worried about insulting people or just making <laughs> people uh, like yeah. uncomfortable by saying the wrong thing. Yeah. Or maybe that's, you know, kind of the problem here is like I'm always worried about saying the wrong thing. So when it comes to people about like gender pronouns or queerness or trans this and that, I get kind of very, very awkward, uh, especially around other people. Um, because again, I don't want to say the wrong thing or hurt anyone's feelings or make anybody uncomfortable. But today, I'm going to forget that, all that shit, and uh, we're going to have an honest conversation in order to make the space for all of us to be better and to better understand ourselves and each other. So in that, with that in mind, uh, I'm super humbled, we're super hyped to have on the pod Ryan Holmes from Brooklyn Boyhood. What's up? <laughs> How's it going, y'all? Yeah, so okay, so first off about Brooklyn Boyhood. So this is kind of what we found on your website. Uh -huh. So our mission is to create spaces where black, brown, queer, and trans boys in our communities can cultivate stories, dreams, and creative work. Uh, so there's like a lot to unpack about that. Mm -hmm. And I understand you, you've been kind of changing your, your mission and yes. kind of reworking it and all of that. So mm -hmm. can you just tell us a little bit about Brooklyn Boyhood Collective and yeah. Brooklyn Boyhood? We, there's five members that are actively doing the work, um, as Brooklyn Boyhood and we're mostly in New York, but we're spread out in Detroit and Miami also. Oh, shit. Ooh. Yeah. Get shout it. out to Miami. Just like life, you know. <laughs> uh, shout out to Van, who's in Miami, Mel in Detroit. Um, but yeah, we have a really just epic group of queer and trans um, black folks who are interested in making the world or leaving the world in a better place than we found it, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, so I feel like we do that through creating space or holding space for our, for our communities, whether that's like physical space, like our parties or events, um, workshops about masculinity, um, brunches or bike rides, um, anything to kind of bring our folks together in a safe way. Um, but it also looks like creating space in terms of digital media, photography. Um, we have an anthology called Outside the XY where folks were able to submit stories about their relationship to masculinity. So yeah, we do a lot of shit. I don't Brooklyn Boyhood. Mm -hmm. Boyhood is spelled B O I <laughs> yes. H O O D. Mm -hmm. So why? Why? Um within the queer community, we I think when when as I was coming up, I felt that um a lot of the identities that we were kind of coming to understand or relate to were based in a lot of heteronormativity. So um, when I was coming up and coming out, and I grew up in Maryland, um, like right outside of DC, but did, hung out a lot in Baltimore and DC, you were either a dom, which was short for dominant, or a femme, <laughs> which was short for feminine or something. Uh, and there was, you were kind of ex expected to adopt these notions of like maleness and masculinity if you were gonna be a legit dom. And if you were a femme, you weren't, you know, the idea was that there was no in between, which is basically mimicking heteronormative society. That's right. right. So within even queerness, there was binary, right? Big time. And that's Huge. problematic still. Big time, yeah. So boy was our way of, um, A, softening the masculinity a little bit. You know, all we wrote everything in lowercase letters and, um, you know, taking that Y off and adding the I was just our way of kind of 
showing the world that we we felt very fluid um, and on purpose. You know, I think people were able to to find similar like fluidity in that word, and they adopted it as well. So, you came up in Maryland. Like, what mm-hmm. what was your backstory, and how did you get to? Because you started, you not, I don't want to give credit to like you started the whole this whole thing, but you helped yeah. spearhead this whole thing. Yeah, me and a friend started this. Um, so yeah, I grew up, uh, you know, very black, uh, very, you know, I had what I needed. We were probably like working class, lower middle class kind of family, um, siblings that love me and stuff. But you know, in black communities, sometimes you don't get the opportunity to find the weirdos. <laughs> they're like really Isn't there a deeply whole thing with that. Yeah. They're there. Yeah. Um but for some reason like anything that was not like you know uh normative of, or yeah, anything like that if it wasn't it was considered, you know, you were acting white. You know. <laughs> so I thought I was like, well, I guess I get need to get the fuck away from y'all cuz I can't cuz there has to be more than this, you know. Um and it, I love my community. Uh, for what it was, but I know that there was so much about me that was different and that I didn't have space to express without ridicule or, like, isolation or all these other things, so. Um, cool, so, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm like, really interested in this. Like, so, you you have your own experience. How did mm-hmm. you find others like you? Like, how, what did Come it on, take? it's Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Right. Yo, yeah. but that's crazy, though, because <laughs> when I first, I actually just kind of ended up in Brooklyn. Um, I knew I wanted to live in New York, but I didn't like, I didn't have like really any vision. I I just knew I wanted to be, if anything, my vision was like the village and stuff that, you know, I experienced when I came to visit. Um, but when I first got to Brooklyn, it was actually kind of hard to find community. Um, it took a little while. Like I was able to kind of make friends, but they weren't folks that I related to for real. Um, it took a few years to like really find folks that I was like, wow, I really see myself in you or... Um, we have like similar goals in life or we just, our energy just flows well. We feel like we were family in another lifetime. Like that's such a gift. Um, and I found that on a really small scale and Brooklyn boyhood was just the manifestation of like us recreating the spaces that we were holding so dear to us in like a larger way to like invite other people into that. Um, so yeah, it was hard at first, but I was kind of trying to be a social butterfly, open my doors. My spot became like the hub, Mm -mm. you know, like having little house parties all the time, people over. I mean, a lot of this, this podcast, you know, we've, we've been using a critical lens to like unpack uh, many of the negative effects of masculinity. Um, But from what you're saying, it sounds like the, the boyhood is repurposing, reimagining masculinity. Um, But Still, how do you avoid those negative effects or manifestations when you s- repurpose this old construct of masculinity? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think Brooklyn Boyhood, we're not like, you know, the holy grail of, <laughs> right. you know, Nobody's queer perfect. at all. Yeah. And I think really what this, this Brooklyn Boyhood allows us to do is to constantly confront our own shit, too. Um, and then also like be in a position to try to hold folks that we know accountable and also support the folks that are negatively affected um, by toxic masculinity or just like, you know, real ill behaviors and like, um, which are usually more femme identified folks or gender nonconforming folks um, or, you know, women and girls. So, um, yeah, I feel like we're, we have such a unique, perspective um by not being cis men but still having like access to masculine privilege and uh sort of navigating in that way that we can I don't know I feel like it's almost like a little superpower like the nuances like the more you kind of um either go through these things Mm -hmm. um or have to constantly like study to try to you know change the way that we live like I feel like it just becomes more apparent. Like things that are, how can I, I feel like I'm bat- rambling, but I feel like the things that are like, you know, those like really nuanced, but violent and like messed up things that men or masculine folks um, can do to women because of the the, the imbalance in power and privilege. Um, I think like, 
I just feel more hyper aware now when at one point I was able to just really just ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Because it wasn't affecting me. It wasn't yeah. my issue. Um, and I'm still checked by people in my life um, that are like, yeah, you didn't have to worry about this because it didn't affect you. But, you know, when you did this thing, like I thought about this for years. You know, this just came up recently with a friend of mine. So would you mind like sharing like more specifically yeah. what that looks like? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know uh, the recent thing that my friend kind of was like, yo, um, I basically uplifted someone uh, that they had had like a previous violent relationship with. And they had, or basically the person had been like mentally abusive and emotionally abusive to them. Um, A, I wasn't supportive enough for them when they were going through it. Mm -hmm. um, B, I probably didn't believe like certain things that they were calling abuse because it, I just didn't have like. The register. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it. and it's just one of those things like, it's a fucked up thing, but sometimes, you know, we don't, people are really quick to be like, oh, she's crazy. <laughs> or this this you know that's she's overreacting yeah she's extra yeah. emotional about this Being so too sensitive yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. which who am i kidding i'm so dramatic but and those are not like i can't even believe i would think in that way because mm -hmm. i'm like usually like i'm really hypersensitive to things but she was like yo you know you you weren't supporting me and then you uplifted this person um and i was there and the only reason really that you did that is because they were like another boy you know and i was like that's true <laughs> it was the reason and I have in, in my past and in, even currently probably I do um, probably sometimes like yeah it's like a, you, you give more respect to you or you you, more, you you favor them like you there's just certain like little things that you might not even notice that you're sure. doing right. um, and then it's not even the fact that you're doing it but the fact that it's actually harming someone else mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying um, who doesn't have the privilege or power to take up uh, space automatically yeah you know what I'm saying like it's an uphill battle for them yeah. to be able to actually come forward and say that yeah because they know they're stepping into a space where inherently the other person just benefits from patriarchy yep. straight up. on literally every level right. so it's like no I mean I feel that and this yeah. is all within a queer community right <laughs> where people really you know and a lot of our folks are like oh I get it you know and they really think they're moving um in ways that are healthy but it's it's kind of a mess you know, and like this masculinity shit, this patriarchy is like, it's hurting us all. So, but we can say. Well, well, what I was going to say is like, I think that's kind of really amazing. Like, that's why the work that you're doing with Brooklyn Boyhood is amazing. Because I think we started out by saying like, something to the, to the effect of we're not the, I forgot the word that you use, but the holy grail, right? And it's like, well, all you can do is provide the space because it's always going to be growth. It's always going to be, you know, questioning. It's always going to be about really looking at ourselves like in the mirror and being like yo like you know i mean i honestly confront my own misogyny as a cisgendered straight woman every day like because i i so i want to thank you for that because i think a lot of times when we're thinking about like queer spaces and we're talking about spaces even like you know like women's spaces or whatever we're like oh no no no, no. like here you're safe here's it's like no this is what we question yeah this is not just about mm -hmm. we're here to like love each other and yeah. like like we this is where we question mm -hmm. and we think bring things to the forefront yeah yeah i feel like people have a hard time even i know for me like it was the hardest thing for me to was to for someone to tell me like you have privilege or power it's hard and, to hear that and accept that yeah Especially when you, your daily life is a struggle or you know the True. ways that you don't or whatever. But the truth is we all have some some level of privilege in some way. Yeah, I mean, it's especially hard as a person of color because you come mm -hmm. and you're like, yo, I'm a victim. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm brown. I'm black. I'm a whatever. Yep. And then you're like, nah, but you also got male privilege. But I'm a victim. Mm -hmm. and, but mm -hmm. yeah. But then if you can allow yourself to be open to it and honest with yourself first. And you can really be sensitive to be like, oh, shit, there is a lot of privilege here that I am uh, benefiting from. I need to check myself. And you can hold accountable. You can hold people accountable in a different type of way. Right. Like, I feel like when if you're if we're able to acknowledge our own shit, then we can be like, listen, when I'm holding you accountable, I'm not holding you accountable because I'm better than you or because, you know, you're you're oppressing me necessarily, but because. I do some bullshit too. And like, if we're not going to be able to talk about it, I don't think that we really can expect equality to happen on a real level, you know? 
Um, so I think one of the things that we want to we want to kind of touch is like what what advice would you give? Like we have a lot of people who, who we know who, who listen to the show who don't necessarily have firsthand experience dealing with people who are openly out. Right. And so they don't really know to ask questions if they should ask questions, if they should just Google, like how do they broach queerness if they don't know? So I also do a lot of work with like young, I guess like young cis men and women uh, from Brooklyn. And I'm trying to think about like the ways that we help them to navigate being like around. Cause it's a lot of queer and trans people uh, in that space. Um, And I think, one of the things that we try to tell them, and maybe this will be helpful to some listeners, is to just like, um, my friend Chino always says this, he goes, you know, A, just sort of train yourself to not just treat people the way that you want to be treated, but the way that they want to be treated. Um, which kind of just gives this like, this shift in thinking of like, it's not my, it's not about my assumptions about like how people want to be held. Um, and that kind of leads to, you know, it's okay to, sometimes like ask people what their pronouns are. Um, if that's something that you're worried about, ask, or just try not to assume. Um, but to be honest, I think it really comes down to just really doing the work to know yourself um, and know the ways that, you know, you might be impacting people's lives. Um, and it kind of like move out of the way in a sense mm-hmm. and trust that everyone, no matter what their differences are, are human beings and deserve the world. We're all we all share this earth. It's, it doesn't belong to anyone. Well, well, then what about like the other side? What mm-hmm. um, what do you say to like the liberals or allies or even you know communities of empowerment for the mm-hmm. LGBTQ communities when it comes to being open towards people who make ignorant comments or yeah. say something stupid? How can we better at you know bridging these gaps and not just retaliating or relying on judgment mm-hmm. and kind of falling in these echo chambers on Facebook and these algorithms that push us towards that. That direction of the question is harder because I think what sometimes people don't understand is, you know, when people make hurtful comments or say the wrong thing, like that might trigger some whole other shit for somebody, you know, where um, you may say something that's wrong and not realize that it'll affect that person's mental health for the next week. But just to always remember that like we all started somewhere you know, like we and to kind of meet people where they're at is a is something that we always put in our community agreements. I don't know who came up with it, but um, and that's really hard. I literally just cussed my brother out like two days ago mm. <laughs> on the phone. We were talking about rape culture mm-hmm. and I didn't like the direct. He's probably even mad I'm talking about this, but <laughs> it's OK, Jordan. I'll, I'm sorry. And I said your name. Sorry, bro. <laughs> but um, yeah, we were talking about rape culture and, and like some of the nuances and like I, he like certain things. And I literally had to hang up because I was like, you you're not agreeing with me but like what I'm saying is truth and like there was all these things that were coming up for me and I was just like <clears throat> hung up on him and he hit me up later he's like I love you like I'm like apologized was accountable and basically it was like but also Ryan like whenever I because I'm not where you are like whenever I say certain things like you totally shut down mm-hmm. and you kind of come at me and I was like bro you know what that means I'm not ready to have this conversation with you go do some research Go talk to some of your homies, <laughs> um, and then let's try again. But it just made me really check myself and sit and think like, all right, if I can't if I can't meet you where you're at, I'm gonna make the conversation worse. Yeah. You're not gonna hear me, and now maybe you won't ever be receptive to what I was trying to say, mm-hmm. you know. So I think it's like important. One of the, the things you said initially was like, yo, I wasn't born woke for real. Straight like, up, nobody was. I, yeah. A lot of experiences and a lot of education got me to where I am. So to, mm-hmm. you know, stand on a pedestal and sometimes react to people or pr- speak down to people yeah. is just arrogant as all get out. It's yeah. a whole lot of classism too. Yeah. And that, and I don't talk know who's going to talk more about that, but it's a lot of classism and just like if, and people, and, and even folks that may have even come from like poor backgrounds or whatever, go get educated and then they like just have no space for those communities. Um, everybody's talking about restorative justice, but like people don't really know what it takes to like sit down and meet people on that level. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, a lot of this stuff it's is just list- a whole bunch of weird stuff. We have to listen to one another, and that's kind mm-hmm. of the hardest part. I have the biggest problem with that. It's just like mm-hmm. instead of just preaching or just speaking down or just talking my ass off, really listening and hearing where people are coming from, and especially if we're coming from a place of having more 
unfortunately, sometimes that's it's to our uh, into our negative. It's a negative situation. Some of the negative abuse we have to go to, but we have more experiences mm -hmm. that inform us, and we have more access to literature and information and people that inform the way that we live. Um, and in a sense, that becomes privilege, and we have to acknowledge that privilege. Big time. And we have to meet people where they're at, mm -hmm. and just. I think one of the things that um, is being pointed out here is um, just the notion of being a compassionate human being. And I think that a lot of times when we have conversations about gender and like conversations about, you know, identity and all of that, we're so wrapped up in, in, in understanding the people that we don't understand and like understanding the other and like I'm straight and you're this and, you you know, you're gay, I'm cis, you're trans, I'm this, you're that. Like how can we come understanding each other? And it's like, Homie, like, when your kid comes home from school and starts to talk some shit to you, you have to understand your child, you have to understand your sister, you have to understand your friend. And it's not like you're painting them in this whole, like, well, you're coming from this category and I'm coming from that category. So we need to find a way to... And I, I think it's helpful, of course, to, you know, having having language helps and all of that. But I think at the end of the day, you know, like, to your point about oneness and, like, really understanding each other as humans, like, it's just so important to to understand that base level and I just feel like the dehumanization that we like the way that we dehumanize one another is so pervasive and we really don't we're not really connected to just the very subtle ways that we do that every day um and I'm, I'm hoping that you know we can start to really look at dehumanization as like something that we could start to really really fade out you know and on that note where do you draw the line between being a group that celebrates and empowers community versus being thought of as exclusionary? Because that does come up. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the interesting thing with this question is that uh, I think one of the ways that we've been thought of as exclusionary the most or in the way that we care about the most um, is in terms of um, folks who feel like they embody masculinity but may not present as masculine or, um, yeah, just like femme-identified folks basically saying that um, Brooklyn boyhood is, is uh, in a lot of ways sort of, um, I can't think of the connector word, but is in a lot of ways, oh, perpetuating, is in a lot of ways sort of perpetuating like this good old boys club thing. Oh, interesting. And, and sort of upholding patriarchy inherently because we are a group of like masculine or center trans. So, um, you know, we hear that, we understand it. We do feel that it's still important for us to have our space. Mm -hmm. So we take that criticism and try to uh, be accountable to it, but we haven't shifted in terms of like, you know, who we feel that we are. Um, you know, so in that, in that way, we've heard that we're cliquish and all these other things, all fine. Um, but I think, that is one of the things that propels um, our responsibility in terms of uh, building new ideas around masculinity and challenging a lot of the things that we're inherently upholding, most likely, just by existing as a group of people. Complicated. Um, and in terms of white folks, uh, we do get a lot of folks that um, are upset that they're white and they can't be in this, or <laughs> uh, that we ask them to not you know, come to certain spaces that are only for people of color. Um, and yeah, we get, we, we've sometimes gotten pushback from it uh, and, and had to kind of explain like, you know, sometimes having too many white folks in a space can, not sometimes, but it completely shifts like what that space is and, and um, how people are able to show up in it. Um, so that's been a challenge. But yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, I think, yeah, those are like the ways I guess we would like draw the line. But I think at the end of the day, um, we just try to do just maintain the fact that we want to uplift and empower ourselves and the people that we kind of see ourselves in. You know, that's like the baseline. Um, and then and that and that looks like all queer and trans people of color <laughs> um, and other folks. We just can't you know, we don't have the capacity to like train white people about how to like not be messed up. Cause like, is it is that what it ends up being? You know what I'm saying? Like a space, cause that's one of the things that I, I, I wonder too. It's like, there's a level of like, okay, you know, 
we're we're doing this like brotherhood, right? And then there's a level to which it's like, okay, well, you're coming over here to learn about oppression. And it's like, that's not what we're doing. So, it, and it's a tricky thing because it's like we're it's like about inclusion, but mm-hmm. then in order for there to be inclusion, there mm-hmm. has to be some sort of exclusion. Yeah. And I mean, those words, you know, we live in America, and <laughs> everything is white, you guys. <laughs> like in terms of institutional power, that's just what it is. Um, but the truth is, America is not white. Um, and there's so much, you know, that we have, but in, in terms of taking up space, it's like, you know, we're literally fighting for our livelihood and fighting for our homes in Brooklyn, you know, in most cities in the, in, in, in this, in this country, um, in your life, in you know what ways. I'm saying? And, and then, yeah. so, so when four white people are like, Oh, can we, I'm like, yo, like, must you have everything? <laughs> I just, I, <laughs> Can't we just do us for a second so that we can. And and also, you know, cis straight folks, too, I think um, we definitely have space for allies, though. And we do have those those spaces that we um, take time to, like, talk to young people that might not identify as queer. But, like, I remember doing having a mentorship program with uh, 17 and 18 year olds that I was doing for a long time. The day after I got jumped by some 17 or 18 year olds. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> Damn. That were like on some like oh you you not know you ain't no you not a dude you think this or whatever you know whole full out situation so like purple eye I'm there at the program the next day like looking to see if any of them were there because mm. it was from their neighborhood shit and then I told them about it you know and and you know at that point that program had just started but I was like we're gonna really get to know each other and I hope that you know my experiences and me being able to tell y'all this will. You know, if somebody like me is in that situation, like four of the people standing around could have stopped it. Mm-hmm. And I hope that one of y'all is that person, you know. Mm-hmm. So like going into these other spaces is like critical because if if my voice hadn't been there, then maybe they, you know, would have saw someone like me dehumanize that person or just not had the courage or the compassion to, to like either not be the, the, the person who's going to inflict violence on them or to, to help interrupt and save that person's life. Well, yeah, let's talk more about, I mean, that's 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 a tough story, but also like how you flipped that and made that mm-hmm. educational and informational and like human, right? Yeah. But you, you quickly mentioned like you're doing mentorship and stuff. Is that, I mean, is that explicitly part of the boyhood or is that you? And if so, like, you know, what are, you, what are the different like educational resources that you yeah, put out there? Um, it's definitely, so uh, Chino, who's one of the, the members, has been a part of this organization, Center for Leadership, for a long time. Um, and he sort of brought in a few of us uh, to kind of do different things. So we have like a, just a relationship with this organization and this other youth group. Youth group. Um, so it is kind of like a collective right. thing. Um, but yeah. I mean, I remember like learning about the boy. I think it was like six or seven years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's that's that's quite a while. It's been longer. Yeah. What was that? What year did y'all start? Two thousand nine. So, yeah, but but yeah, yeah, two thousand nine. So it's almost been a decade. It's almost been a decade. That's yeah. crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, within that, like, what have some what are some valuable you know lessons you you personally have learned in that time? You know, building and being a part of this community. Yeah, I think. Some of the biggest ones are that, you know, I've never, I, I won't ever have arrived, you know. Um, I'm always going to be learning. And, and staying open to learning is going to help me to, like, love myself because I'll be able to stand myself. <laughs> um, and then the other lesson, I think, is that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really challenging to maintain any kind of relationship. So in terms of us being a collective and like existing for almost 10 years, um, I definitely belittled the amount of work, work it takes to make relationships healthy, (laughs) whether it's romantic or friendship or whatever, um, or work relationships. So achieving that balance is a whole lot of stepping up and stepping back, you know, um, being honest, as honest with myself as possible and as honest with the people that I love as possible are some of like the the biggest lessons um ever and to just listen to young people and our elders like i have a lot of we have a lot of intergenerational connections um that's awesome and they've just taught me all the things you know just having those two different perspectives while i'm here um 
hey, can't thank you enough for for just like the 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 cohesion. I feel like you really touched on so many different points and really painted a picture of what togetherness looks like and to, like responsible togetherness, right? Like checking yourself really like teaching learning it's a it's a beautiful thing what's cool about this is like again we've spent a lot of time using a critical lens to look at masculinity and it's it's cool to see that you know there's there are some negative effects that have even uh, afflicted kind of the queer community but there's also a really great opportunity to be empowering with that community as well so thanks ryan for being here and this i mean dropping knowledge and really giving us that insider's look on what that community looks like and how it's growing and how it's changing and how we're all affected by masculinity yes great so on that note we're gonna go ahead and dip out we just want to thank you for listening uh please be sure to communicate let us know how you feel about this conversation be sure to check us out on twitter at masculinity pod that's with a k always masculinity podcast on facebook always with a k again uh, shoot us an email at masculinitypodcast at whoistheo.com. And uh, with that, I'll just say that this has been Masculinity. My name is Samantha Zessi. Yo, my name is Ramoy George Phil the first. <laughs> Have a good one. Peace. <laughs>